Hello everyone, this is William Samuel from Alabama at Woodsong and I'm sending you a tape that I think you may enjoy. On this tape I intend simply to read you selections from some of our forthcoming books and publications that are in the writing here at Woodsong. Why do the innocent seem to suffer so? It's a question I've been asked so many times. But I am able to answer only from the solipsistic viewpoint. It is always the suffering human viewpoint that asks the question. And it's that same suffering human viewpoint that seems to suffer in ways difficult for the human of us to understand. Awareness doesn't suffer. This is what the wise men tell us. Oh, but our reply is, but there's often the sight and the sound of suffering within awareness. Yes, yes, answer the wise men, but there's a deeper life surrounding awareness beyond the ebb and flow of feeling. Feeling that is not feeling, they say. Not feeling is not suffering, they say. Well, that's what the wise men say. But I know something better. The children were marking circles in the sand with their fingers. Nearby, a group of young teens chased each other in circles over the grass, falling, laughing, rolling arm in arm, making larger circles around the small ones, invisible circles around those etched in the sand, plain to see. I'm one who has spent considerable time watching clouds and falling leaves. Everyone knows the game of imagery that comes from watching clouds. Those puffy billows that are a puppy's head one moment and a lovely lady's the next. But not so many know the fine points of watching falling leaves. Among some of those points are these. When left alone to fall as they choose, not beaten by the rain or whipped with the wind, leaves fall, making circles just the way children do. And older leaves, like older children, make little circles inside larger ones. Laurel leaves, for instance, should ever a person happen to see one, the very moment it turns loose on a still day, will see it wind its way spinning side over side so fast it's like a little propeller gone wild. Now those spinning circles it makes slows its descent and moves it in a greater circle round and round to the earth. Suppose we say shiny top side heads, bottom side tails, well, laurel leaves usually land tails up to kiss the earth, maybe, because they've spent so many hours looking at the sun. Now, oak leaves, especially white oak leaves, fall slowly and majestically, sailing, sailing a slow circle once around the great trunk, twice around if it falls from a uh, a limb high enough. I saw one make 
three circles around once, unmarked circles, corkscrew spirals as the leaf sought out its next place to survey the scene. The wind blows in circles, too. Little circles, like dust devils that whip leaves back into the air, a circular galaxy of leaves that tumble back to the earth again, and again, and again. And over end tumbles, making circles again. Little circles within big ones. The winds of thunderstorms, such as we have right now raging outside Woodsong, move in larger circles. And tornadoes are powerful, smaller circles within greater ones. They're no different, and they're very little more destructive than the children tumbling on the grass. The great currents of air, jet streams move in still greater circles around the entire earth. And we come back to water. Water makes circles, little circles from the, from the eddies behind the brook stones to great circles and circular routes through the oceans that span the whole globe. The earth spins day and night also, making small circles within the great circle it wheels around the sun each year. And the sun makes its circles within circles around the Milky Way. And the galaxy turns like a giant cluster of countless leaves circling something. The whole tangible universe inscribes circles within circles within unseen circles, round and round, a cosmic child drawing circles in the sand. All this movement declares to me the absolute uniqueness of rest. These many circles, seen and unseen, herald the Father of Lights with whom is no circling variable no, not even a shadow of turning. The ineffable alone is at rest. You know, that peace and power and rest are here, right now, close as children tumbling in the grass, close as a circle and a grain of sand. And every bit of it Every bit of it is perfect, just the way it's happening, and just the way it is. She grows weaker each day, they say, <laughs> but God doesn't. She wastes away a bit each day, they say, but, but God doesn't. She moves more slowly each day. But God, it is said, doesn't move at all. Where can omnipresence go that it isn't already? Perhaps God moves within himself, movement within non-movement like moving lines within motionless planes, or the way rivers move within their motionless banks, like leaves make circles within circles and rest, Innocence doesn't suffer, and, of course, guilt is unreal. One of the enigmatic statements attributed to an old Zen master, there's nothing better than eating food and wearing clothes. Outside of this, there is neither Buddhas, nor patriarchs, nor masters, nor enlightened people. It's a good statement. But it just seems so long <laughs> to make this discovery. It's a little like the Indian would say, this and not that, that and not this, or either. 
And then they go on to say, in their own way, they're all perfect. And for me, it brings to mind the Chinese general who looked at my old Taoist master and me through those narrow eyes of his and said, Mao Guanxi, Mao Guanxi, it makes no difference. It makes no difference. Readers, dare I tell you that Oh, Mr. Sure and myself were surrendering ourselves to the general's mercy after mistaking one of his soldiers for the enemy. The soldier was sprawled across the hood of my jeep where he had fallen. Mayo Guanchi, the general said, waving Mr. Sure and I away as if to say, where are thine accusers? I do not accuse thee. But it was years and years before I learned how to stop carrying that soldier on the hood of my Jeep and across the hood of many automobiles. I recall the story of the Zen teacher and his faithful disciple who belonged to a celibate order. They came to a stream that could ordinarily be waded easily, but this day the stream was swollen so that the crossing, crossing was not easily done. A beautiful lady was waiting there for someone to help her across when the patriarch and his disciple arrived. The lady quickly begged them to help her across. The young disciple, remembering that he was not permitted to talk to women, much less touch one, shook his head fiercely. No, 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 no. But the old teacher said calmly to the lady, If we carry you on our shoulders together, my friend and I, we can take you across safely. Then he told the woman to pick up her bundles and climb on their shoulders. Together the old cheat teacher and his friend carried her safely across the stream. There he bade her goodbye and wished her a joyful journey. The two men continued their journey, but the young man fell strangely silent. For three days as they walked, he said nothing to the master. Then in the evening when they were preparing to sleep beside the trail, the young man looked at last at the old teacher and he said most earnestly, Master, how are you able to take your vows so lightly? You are forbidden, just as I, never to speak to a woman or touch one, yet you broke that vow without hesitation and answered the woman's request for help. You bade me to carry her across the stream, and by obeying you, I broke my vow. I've been silent for three days about this matter, attempting to understand your action. Master, I cannot. I cannot. Will you explain to me, venerable patriarch, how you can be so frivolous? And the old man replied, Dear young friend, we carried the lady across the stream because it's good to help anyone in need. I put her down on the other bank. Here it is three days later and you're still carrying her on your shoulders. Put her down quickly, my son, before your back is bent. We just be, we just be. 
we walk the circle all around and just be. Then our food tastes good again. After we've walked the circle full around and our clothes feel warm again. After we've walked the circle full around and all between is male want you. Male want you. It is said to be difficult to hold to the truth without cessation. Or as we might say it now, to hold to the solipsistic idea without cessation. I don't think it's necessary to hold to the solipsistic idea without cessation. You see, the solipsistic idea is a fact. One doesn't have to remain conscious of the fact that it is a fact continually to try to hang on to an idea so that it never leaves consciousness is like sticking a knife in one's gums to remain mindful of his teeth. Once we know there are teeth in the mouth, we do what's required with them. Once we know that life is God's self-awareness, we are aware as we are aware as we are aware each moment and there is no more we we must struggle to control what awareness entertains the we is gone mind is left on the scene the custodian of awareness the divine mind is the custodian of this awareness Right here, right now, listening to these words. It needs to be emphasized and re-emphasized. The peace, the inner quiet, the nirvanic moment is the purpose of all this talking, all these tapes, all these words, all the reading, all the study, one's contemplation is to bring about that magic moment. One's discipline is worthless if it brings us to the magic kingdom, across it and beyond it, while we are so caught up in thoughts and study that we don't see the magic trees that are standing tall in the morning sunshine. Let me keep saying this so that we might continually expect the wondrous wild moment of peace. We await this. This is the season. And this is the reason for every discipline. It's not the words themselves. Not the stories themselves. But what happens between them. And behind them. And under them. And over them. It's what's between the lines, under the lines, not the words themselves, not the one talking, but the awareness listening. Someone wrote and said, who's Rachel? <laughs> Who Rachel? Well, Rachel is my wife. And this following selection just says something about her. And there are childlike people, and there are people with childlike ways. There are persons who can behave in childlike ways when they're feeling childlike, or when it's the thing to do. But my Rachel is none of these. She's way more than a person with childlike ways. She's a child. I don't know what makes her like this, but it's grand. I suspect that when she grew into an adult, it took her much less time than the rest of us to determine how much more meaningful and rewarding it is to be the child, the guileless and innocent child, the unpresuming child, 
the open and honest child. Well, Rachel is presently planting the garden that she planned all winter. <laughs> She's out there working in the upturned fertile soil that she prepared all winter, <laughs> mulched and fertilized and treated since the last tomato and bean of last summer. Periodically I peep up from the typewriter to see if the earth is still around and there stands, sits, squats, crouches, Rachel, <laughs> talking, talking, talking. Talking to whom? Dogs are sleeping. The birds are too far away. Whom do you suppose she's talking to? Well, to the seed she's planting, of course. <laughs> Telling them what's expected of them and how lucky they are to be able to live and grow in her beautiful garden. But all that talking couldn't be to the seed alone. A worm appears from under the mulch. So Rachel greets it and exclaims as to how rich it's making the soil. <laughs> My Rachel, trowel poised to begin a row for the chard, speaks aloud to all the bugs to watch out because here she comes. Get your long wriggly cells out of the way. Uh-oh. Excuse me. Now you're two worms. Get back to work, both of you. She talks and puffs and talks and plants. Me and the dogs and the birds watch her and know she's grand. Like every child, she has all of us to guard her and take care of her and protect her from harm. Oh, yes, indeed. The dogs and I, the birds and I, would like to be able to say, Rachel's mine, but we can't. She belongs to the world. All children belong to the world. Yes. I have just changed microphones and I want to make sure it's working right. I'm very good at forgetting to plug microphones in and, and using ones that don't work and occasionally those that have batteries in them are used without batteries. Now this one is one that appears to have been walked on by someone with cleats and it has a battery in it but it seems to be working all right so this is what I'm going to use this in response to many letters there is a new way to think Yes, there is another way to think thoughts. Without, without it, one remains lost in the world. And with it, one may come to understand infinity. Without it, the world continues to move toward decay and death. With it, with what? Why? With the new way of thinking. With it, the universe is renewed and the weary find rest. Follows now two brief Han stories. Han, if you remember, is the old master, the old sage around whom quite a uh, book is being constructed at the moment. You say there's a new way to think, Master Han? Yes, yes, the old man replied. 
And it is very helpful that we stop thinking in the old way. Can you teach me the new way? His friend Ho asked. It is not something that can be taught, Han answered. But it is, a, it is something that we may talk about and talk about until one day, quite without noticing, the art has been acquired. Ho smiled with relief. Then, let us begin talking about it, Master. It's essential that I learn it. The old master smiled. Those who hunger after wisdom learn the new way, whether they strive or not, whether they wish to or not, for wisdom is the new way. At another time, soldier asked the old master what he meant by top-down thinking as opposed to the conventional bottom-up thinking that the world engaged in. The old teacher smiled and then pointed to a, to a distant mountain and said, instead of that mountain, see the great pyramid of Egypt in the mind's eye. Imagine now, imagine if you will, the floor of the pyramid filled with a multitude of people all looking toward the pyramid's peak. Notice that each line represents a singular point of view. Each point of view differs from all other points of view, only slightly from those that are close at hand but markedly from those in the far corners of the pyramid. Do you see this? The soldier sat and thought a moment. Finally, he said, yes, yes, I, I can do that. I see a multitude of, of uh, lines of thought from the base of the pyramid, each coming from a point of view and all of them coming together at the top of the pyramid. And I perceive now that each string or each line of thought is located differently from all others. Good. Now, said the old teacher, how would one point of view describe the peak of the pyramid? Well, it would describe it precisely as it saw it, replied the soldier. Yes, said Han, but now, how would another point of view describe the peak of the pyramid? The soldier thought, it would describe it somewhat differently. Yes, said Han. And how would each line of thought describe each other line of thought or point of view? The soldier was thoughtful for a moment. He answered finally, I don't think he could. Not accurately anyway. He can really only describe his own point of view, his own line of thought. That's the only one he can do most honestly. Yes, the teacher answered. You are exactly right. But notice something now, friend soldier. Suppose someone turns his thinking over completely and he climbs to the apex of the pyramid and there from the apex of the pyramid he views down and at the base. Notice the apex of the pyramid looks downward and, and encompasses the entire base. The apex perceives every point of view and can describe each precisely. 
seeing them holistically in their allness or individually in their multiplicity. Yes, yes, I see, mused the soldier. While the bottom-up view is not incorrect, it can only make a limited statement of the whole, but the top-down view can see all that is to be seen of the pyramid and describe it in its fullness. Well, I've lost my little ding-donger to go on my thing, so I'll hit it with a fountain pen. Okay, in order to hammer home the point gently that was made on with the stories, the Han stories on the other side, bottom up, thinking bottom up wise, that is bottom up beginning with the problem, trying to reach infinity, starting with the anguish, trying to reach a state of anguishlessness, we see self-destruction going on and the solution escapes everyone. <laughs> oh, as it must have escaped the Romans <laughs> as their society collapsed. But now top down, top down, beginning with God, beginning with allness, beginning with wholeness, we can see that appearances, tangible appearances, obversely represent the dissolution of mortal mind, ego, the old man, whatever you want to call it. Likewise, top down, we see that responsibility for action, the responsibility for what to do doesn't lie out there with the, with the government. It doesn't lie out there with, uh, with drugs or society or family, or sons, or church, but always here as awareness. The initial responsibility for action lies here as awareness. To see the world for the God self that it is. That is, we get the beam out of this eye before we worry about the moat, which has all society uh, dying of, of super radiation or something. We make a holistic survey of God here as identity. First, first, first. Then, then find ourselves amazing with a knowledge of what to do. If anything, about the scene at hand. Inevitably, there is a what to do. There is nothing about this activity that is lethargic. There is nothing about this activity that's a sitting back and doing nothing. There is everything about this activity which seems to allow one to most miraculously see what to do and to be the doer on the scene. Well, what to do? Let me be specific. For myself, just for me, the only point of view or line of thought that I can articulate with honesty. I keep hearing the Christ statement that it isn't what goes into the mouth that causes trouble, but what comes out of it. Well now, well now, when this scene is considered holistically, then the scene, however it is, and at the moment there are black clouds everywhere and a thunderstorm in the making, the scene is my own single eye view of God's self. Now when I say my own single eye view of God's self, that's not quite as accurately as it can be said. It should be said. It is awarenesses that I as awareness survey God's self. Because there is no other self to survey. For, nor for that matter is there an individual I called Bill with any personal responsibility who isn't already functioning as God's will being done. Already happening. Therefore, I get the beam out of this eye right here. 
I stop spewing vitriol and venom to pollute the rivers of life on earth. I stop spouting controlling rules and regulations. Thou shalt do this and thou shalt not do that. I stop making personal demands. I stop all opinions of guilt upon my selfhood images seen to infinity and seen as this very identity, I. I, right here is I, end all the wanton ego scratching habits that would destroy what appears to be this body point of view called Bill. <laughs> and I begin making sure that the words that come from this mouth are honest, are healing, not divisive, are honest as best I can make them honest, are helpful to whatever extent I can articulate the helpfulness that is already, that is God present already. Okay, that's what I do in these uncertain times for my view of humanity. Just that. And it's as simple as that. It uh, isn't necessary for everything to make sense. Yet the world uses making sense as an excuse to justify an empty mysticism which is only the mirrored reflection of simplicity. The statement that moves one toward childlikeness and simplicity is trustworthy. The statement that fosters and feeds the mills of the mystic is not worthy of the world. Yet, both messages are around, both are included, both are identity, even as two sides of the coin. There is a child in us that sees the child in everyone. The child laughs. The child sees beauty. The child plays games. The child is honest. The child is real. And the child is eternal. The real fact is, the child is the whole of us. The real of us. And of everyone. The child knows <laughs> the real. The child also marvelously perceives which of the 10,000 things are genuine notes of the symphony and which are the discords to make them plain. Only the child of us knows the wheat from the tares. And only the child of us has the courage to leave the tares alone until the harvest. Bottom up. Bottom up. Being very short on thoughtfulness myself, I am long on spotting it out there, especially when someone isn't sensitive enough toward me or something. Top down. Top down. One mind for which this awareness is the functioning. Thoughtful and thoughtless are two ends of the same stick. Thoughtful and thoughtless are one awareness for which the ineffable mind, God, is responsible. As awareness, <laughs> I rest right there. Comfort is felt again. We've uncovered it immediately. Now I can state still another reason for playing the role of a child. One really is the child, of course, and the role is natural. The world doesn't know that, apparently, so it goes on with the games of adult roles, believing them to be true. <laughs> Ridiculous. Uh, now, the new reason for the role of the child goes thus. The higher the role played in the world, the less freedom it offers. The lower the role, 
the more freedom at its every elbow and knee. Well, how so? How so? Well, consider the enlightened uh, man, the, the guru, <laughs> is constrained to play that part. He's constrained to behave as a guru, moving with slow grace, <laughs> followed by disciples clutching the pedals that he's given them. The practitioners. The practitioner is restricted to conduct natural only <laughs> to practitioners. Speaking sonorously, making inspirational statements that he hopes will produce instantaneous healings or something like that. I hear people say, oh, but the, the practitioner's conduct comes naturally. Well, that's a lot of bull feathers because I've been there. Take the minister. The minister must minister. The minister has to work on Sunday and on Wednesday night. He visits hospitals and conducts funerals, <laughs> all part of the role. But the child's role, the child's role is a sway with rippling freedom, blowing rapt attention from bug watching <laughs> to rolling in the grass at a moment's notice, from tree climbing to poring over picture books for hours or fence balancing or just general hop along watching what will pop up or what will come along or what will float down or, or what will shout next. Furthermore, Furthermore, this child role has no arguers about it. After all, a child is expected to behave like a child. There isn't someone saying he isn't pinching his nose hard enough. He isn't, <laughs> he isn't walking uh, the way he should. He isn't dressed the way he should be. He isn't as attentive or this or that. The child is just a child. Whatever ridiculous thing the child might do, whatever, it has the nearly absolute freedom to do it because, after all, children will be children. I note also that every adult role seems to hinge on something that hangs precariously from something external to itself. For instance, the minister uh, needs a congregation. Without a congregation, he's terribly frustrated. But not just a congregation, it must be a growing, swelling, profitable congregation. He also needs a church building to keep adding on to. And all kinds of energetic people who work for nothing <laughs> because they're, of course, earning stars for their crown. And the practitioner needs a practice. A practice who needs his assistance and he needs an understanding practice. Folks willing to pay for the reward he prefers or appears to cause to happen. But now, in light of that, friends, consider the child's role in this regard. His action is never hampered by an out there. There is nothing hanging externally from some kind of a something out there. For out there is here to the child. The out there is always right here to the little one. How about the, the pilot's role for me right now? The pilot's role for me. Why? I not only have an airplane already, but I am one. I am one. Arms outstretched, I'm the latest model. <laughs> Arms outstretched, I'm the Red Baron in his airplane. But I can be the Blue Max or anybody else I care to be. And I don't need gasoline to fly these planes, nor a license, nor the battle with government regulations about flight plans, logs, night flying and landing equipment and all that junk, that stuff comes with the plane. And the plane and the pilot come with a flight of the fancy 
and angel clouds to float through. Instantly, instantly, all that the child needs is here. Or instantaneously, as the practitioner would like to say. And so it goes, so it goes through the whole litany of the unencumbered child consciousness. Everything necessary for the dream comes into being immediately right along with the dream. And I am not separate from that dream. Dream and I are one. Still, there is something more, even more remarkable about the child's role that isn't quickly perceived by ordinary humans <laughs> playing their adulterous roles. They never think of it. The child, the child is kept from excesses or from harmful adventures by the guidance of his mom and dad. Ah, but upon returning to the child again, after the disastrous years of adulthood, the futile years of trying to live the adult, to rediscover the child, ah, we are still with guidance to protect us from every storm. This time, as I play the role, I am very conscious of Father, Mother, God behind me saying, this is the way, this is the way, Waukee, in it. And this guidance is tender. This guidance is gentle. This time there is no, you can't do this. You must stop that this instant. None of that. This time I hear wisdom would do thus and such. If you are wise, you will do thus and such. And you are wise because you're wisdom. And therefore I do thus and such as it comes to be done. Even as right now it comes to be done to sit here and read these words. Oh, I've been told that it's very difficult to become childlike again. Some people say I'm too alone, I'm too vulnerable. Some people say, I'm naked when I'm like that. I'm bleeding when I'm like that. Well, let me ask something. Should such a child come walking in here right now, right here where you listen to these words, what would we do? Should a naked child enter this room right now, cold and hungry, frightened, lost, trembling, what would we do? Wouldn't we sweep that one up in our arms to warm and comfort it? Wouldn't we give it warm clothing and, and, and put something warm in front of it to eat? Wouldn't we bathe it, love it? Wouldn't we do everything in our power to put a smile on its face again? Of course we would. <laughs> of course we would. And so it is. So it is with those of us who have, have somehow found the strength to be brave enough to be naked before the world who are brave enough to, to become again as children, we are cared for by a discerning world in ways that are not dreamt of. The story of Old Croak, a story about discontent. Old Croak lived in a mill pond with 10,000 other frogs. Each night he sang in the chorus and their melody could be heard for miles. Upon reaching manhood, a disquiet grew within Croak and he decided to that there was more to life than singing a, a song from a lily pad. This incessant peeping and croaking is driving me mad. What I need is quiet. Quiet. Well, bidding his friends goodbye, Croak made a gigantic leap into the darkness of anywhere but here. 
Well, as it happened, a carnival which had closed for the night was located in the field by the pond. Croak's mighty leap carried him up over the pond through a small opening into the very center of the house of mirrors. Not knowing where he had landed, Croak sat huddled in the inky darkness of the closed hall of mirrors, awaiting the morning light. Everything was strangely silent, and strangely he missed the chorus. Croak, said old Croak. His voice was louder, and it echoed strangely, and it was more resonant than usual, but there was no reply. Croak was alone in his silence, and for the first time, his disquiet included lonely. The next morning, Croak opened his eyes to find himself in the center of 10,000 frogs. Aha, he said, you decided to follow me here. <laughs> Why didn't you answer me last night when I croaked? 10,000 mouths moved but no sound came from any of them. Croak was puzzled. Why don't you answer me, he asked. 10,000 miles moved, but there was no answer. Croak frowned. What kind of a silly game is this? 10,000 frogs frowned and moved their mouths, but there was only silence. Is this the sort of punishment I get? For complaining of singing in the chorus every night, he asked. Mouths moved in silence. Croak stamped the floor in anger and threw himself into a double backward flip. Ten thousand angry frogs stamped the floor and threw themselves into a double backward flip. I thought I was the only one at the pond who could do a double backward flip, mumbled and umbled Croak. They've been holding out on me, he said, sulking to the floor. 10,000 mumbled silently. 10,000 sulked to the floor. As the days went by, as the days went by, Croak came to several conclusions. Grand metaphysical conclusions. I've gone deaf, he thought. <laughs> Somehow the mighty leap from the lily pad had damaged his hearing. I'm being punished by the other frogs. They, they, they're mocking every move I make. But then, after a few more days, the metaphysics became a bit deeper, and Croak decided that there was greater meaning behind the appearances than he had first believed. Aha, uh -huh, he croaked. There is metaphysical significance here, definitely, definitely. I can't help but notice that no one moves unless I move. If I hop a short distance, they hop a short distance. If I do my mighty backward double flip, they do precisely the same. It seems to me that what is being made here clearly is that I am the power of this scene, everyone does what I do. Therefore, aha, I shall now teach them to do what I say do. All right, you guys, enough of this togetherness stuff. I want to be alone. 10,000 miles move. Okay, all of you, pay attention to me now. Leave the room, croaked old croak. 10,000 miles moved but no one left the room. Well, thought Crow, I must, apparently, I must lead the way and show them how to do what I say to do. He ordered them to leave the room again. And this time as he ordered them to leave the room, he jumped behind a piece of bric-a-brac on the floor. And from behind the bric-a-brac, Crow could only see half as many frogs in the mirror. Good, he shouted, good. Half of you have left the room just as I ordered. All right, now all of you that are out of the room, I want you to stay out of the room. And all of you that are still in the room, all of you that are still in the room, 
I want you to leave the room. And just as he said that, he leaped from behind the bric-a-brac. Promptly, half the frogs jumped from Croak's view, but the other half jumped back into the room. Oh, come on, fellas, come on now. 10,000 frog mouths moved in insolent silence. Okay, now let's try that again, said Croak. But wherever he hopped and whatever he did, he could never get the frogs to leave the room. At one point, he leapt into a box and he thought for a minute he was alone. Then looking directly overhead, he saw a thousand frogs peering down at him from identical boxes. Smart Alex, croaked, shouted croak, leaping back into the center of the room, followed by 10,000 mocking frogs. Oh, I've learned to read lips and they've all called me a smart Alec, he moaned. Whoa, I tell you, this is too much for me. I must get away. I simply must get away. That night, Croak sat sobbing on the floor, silently. He thought of the old days when darkness was a time for singing and sunshine, a time for playing, not leading the world of frogs, trying to make them do the things that were pleasing to him. Oh, the world does everything I do, but nothing I tell them to do, he moaned. Then in anguish, he said, I give up. I surrender. Whatever the scheme of things, it's too much for me to fathom. Then through his tears, Croak beheld a shaft of moonlight streaming through a hole in the wall. Without hesitation, and with no thought whatever for the consequences, Croak mustered every ounce of strength and leapt through the hole toward the moonlight above. It was a mighty leap a backward triple somersault and a half gainer that put him on a lily pad in the middle of his pond. The moonlight was very bright that night. Croak looked around and not one of the 10,000 frogs was in sight. At last I am alone, he rejoiced in delight to be answered by 10,000 voices celebrating his return. <laughs> Meanwhile, back at the House of Mirrors, one mirror asked another, Hey, did you ever see 10,000 frogs jump out of a room at once? They sure did pass on quickly, didn't they? Pass on nothing, said the first mirror. They simply have moved to another plane of consciousness. No, 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 they're dead and gone, said the corner mirror. I saw them all leap into the fire at one time. Light, my friend, light, not fire. They're still alive. I can contact them. Oh, they're dead and gone. The moon, the moon overhead, hearing the argument among the mirrors, whispered in moon talk, understandable only to mirrors, children, and whatever shines in the dark said the moon. There was no life in the images. Therefore, life cannot leave the images. Isn't that so? All the mirrors answered, yes. Yes, indeed. On his lily pad in the pond, old Croak heard the moon too. He looked into the water and saw the moon's reflection there. Suddenly he understood who the 10,000 frogs were and who he was.